right, good morning and welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. Um, a welcome as well for people watching on the internet. Uh, I'm going to uh, keep it short here. Today we're going to talk about um, Maryland control versus win, a case on, um, in front of the Supreme Court on how and whether Maryland is uh, allowed to and should tax the uh, out-of-state income of its residents, Karen and Brian Wynn, uh, and by implication, uh, other residents as well, I suppose. To discuss this case today, we have uh, Joe Henchman of the Tax Foundation, Ed Zielinski of the Cardoso School of Law, and Ellen Biard, uh, who's here at the American Enterprise Institute, to um, uh, kick off our discussion, which will consist of, say, three 20-minute statements and then a Q&A. Um, first, I'll, I'd like to introduce uh, Joe Henchman. He is an attorney and policy analyst who has supervised the, the Tax Foundation's state policy program since 2009 and legal program since 2007, uh, analyzing state tax trends, constitutional issues, and uh, tax law developments. Um, uh, Henchman is admitted to practice law in the state of Maryland, District of Columbia, and before the United States Supreme Court. Um, well, please do go ahead. Uh, good morning. Um, I want to thank AEI and, and Alan for inviting me today, and thank all of you for taking your time out to come and hear about uh, a bit of a sleeper case, but one that if it goes the wrong way could significantly upend the entire state, I the interstate tax system in the United States. So uh, I really hope that this is, that there will not be a, another conference about the Wynn case uh, afterwards, uh, in which case, it, you know, it goes the wrong way and we have to decide uh, how we, we deal with the aftermath. Um, so we'll, we'll see uh, this year. Um, <clears throat> How many of you are familiar with the case to the extent where you've read some of the briefs? It's about half and a half. Uh, a, a short uh, summation of it, um, Maryland has a state income tax, but they also have many local income taxes that are uh, part of state law. So if you live in Maryland, you will pay your state income tax, but your form will also include a line for your county income tax, or if you live in the city of Baltimore, Baltimore income tax. And they're considerable. Uh, they, uh, most Maryland residents will pay a 3.2 percent income, uh, local income tax if you're in Montgomery County, City of Baltimore, or Prince George's County, which is where a lot of Maryland's population lives, or Anne Arundel County also, um, in addition to the, the state income tax. So uh, it's, it's, it's always important for us when we present, uh, compare state income taxes with each other, we always have a little notation on Maryland that they have considerable local income taxes, more than just about any jurisdiction uh, except for New York City. Uh, <clears throat> Maryland, like every state in the Union, and uh, the Council on State Taxation isn't here, but they have a brief where some poor person on their staff went and found every statute uh, for every state of, of the credit for taxes paid to another state, and, and it lists them in that brief. So if you want the citation for every state, it's in the, in the cost amicus brief, which is a very good work on their part. Uh, every state, uh, including Maryland, provides a credit for taxes paid to another state. So if you are, say, a couple who ha has a, a, a business that engages in activity in, uh, you know, 30, 40 states, uh, as was envisioned by our founders, that the United States would become one vast free trade zone where people could uh, engage in interstate commerce without states trying to stop them. Uh, if you do that, uh, and you earn income in more than one state, you uh, are not double taxed on that income because each state is limited to taxing just the income generated in each state. Uh, and the, the mechanism for that is the credit for taxes paid to another state. Maryland has decided not to honor that credit to the extent it uh, applies against the local, the local income taxes. So the, the couple at issue, the wins, Mr. and Mrs. Wynn, uh, they are that couple. They earn income in, uh, I think it was like 43 states or something. And uh, they applied to Maryland for the credit against the local income taxes that they pay to their home county and were denied. And they sued, as Americans do, and uh, prevailed at, the, uh, at the, the High Court of Maryland, the Maryland Court of Appeals. And uh, Maryland is now appealing that to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court, being thorough in its job, asked the Solicitor General for his views, and he submitted a terrible brief, uh, which honestly should get an F in any law school class, because, uh, you know, the, Professor Zelensky is the professor, so he'll set us straight, but the way I learned it in, when I went through law school is that you 
have to analyze all issues, you know, these issue spotters. And uh, for an interstate commerce claim, you have to look at both whether the state has the power to tax it as, you know, out of its own constitution and the power to set its taxes, um, which the Solicitor General did, and he said, uh, yes, Maryland has the authority to uh, grant exemptions or deny exemptions as a matter of legislative grace. But he stopped his analysis there, did not go to the second question of, this has something to do with interstate commerce, and there's a whole line of interstate commerce cases that uh, have to be analyzed, because there are some things that states cannot do uh, because they infringe on the interstate market and the ability of, of people to buy and sell across state lines. Uh, it's not that the Solicitor General analyzed that and concluded it, it didn't apply. That's, that would be commendable. That, that is doing it. It's, he didn't even mention it at all. And uh, that's a big problem. And then the Supreme Court granted cert, uh, <clears throat> which, uh, as we all know, the Supreme Court uh, is asked to grant cert 10,000 times a year, and they do so in an infin infinitesimal percentage of cases, uh, usually about 60, 70, 80, 90 a year, uh, including this one. And as a state tax practitioner who every year pleads with the court in desperate pleadings and briefs asking them to take important interstate tax cases, and they never do, and then for them to take this one. It's very alarming. Uh, so we submitted a brief, as did a number of people. There's uh, quite a few amicus briefs in this case, including uh, uh, some of the, the, the panelists up here. Um, ours was short and sweet. Um, we're trying to do more short and sweet briefs, focusing on kind of one or two points to really drive home. So it's a, it's a brief 10 pages talking about um, why Maryland's tax law should be addressed under the Interstate Commerce Clause. Um, we want to kind of short circuit this argument that it's a local tax and therefore it's not really a, a state law because it, it, it is a state law, uh, as well as the importance of recognizing that what's at issue here is that uh, the winds, as is, is in the case, the name of the case. Uh, they're residents of Maryland, and if they had invested only in Maryland, they would not be double taxed because they invested interstate Maryland's laws double tax them. And this is something that states cannot do under the Commerce Clause. That's our argument. Um, so it, it's, uh, I was just on a call about this case a couple of weeks ago, and it really is a sleeper issue. So uh, I, I do commend all of you for, for taking the time out to, to learn more about it, because uh, this, I really can't understate how much this will upend and unravel the state tax, state tax system and the interstate tax system if the court rules the wrong way on it. Um, states only provide the credit for taxes paid to another state because they think they have to. Uh, every incentive is for them to not offer it. Why would they uh, not want to double tax, triple tax, 50 times tax every income from anybody with any re remote nexus to a state? Um, the danger, of course, is that uh, if you live in a state or work in a state, or travel to a state, that is enough for a state to impose its full income tax on all of your income. And the only thing standing in, it in that way is the Commerce Clause. Well, there's legislative grace, but uh, you know, as a, again, as a state tax practitioner, I don't put a lot of uh, trust in that, holding back the, uh, the water. Um, but the credit for taxes paid to another state based on the interstate commerce uh, uh, clauses, uh, constitutional requirements. And, uh, uh, Fred from Cost did join us. Fred, you missed a bit of a shout out I, I gave to uh, who was the researcher, it might have been you, to who dug up the citation for every state's credit for taxes paid to another state that was in your brief. Okay. Great work. Law firm here, you need to hire whoever that was because that, that was not easy work. Um, so that's a bit about uh, why we consider this case very alarming, why we filed an amicus brief in it at, at the Tax Foundation. And uh, why we're, we're very interested to see where the court goes with it. I'm really hopeful that uh, you know the, the other side has to turn in their briefs in a couple of weeks, and the Supreme Court will the next day, you know, I can dream the next day say you know dismissed is improvidently granted. We we made a mistake. There's there's no issue here. Maryland got it right. Um, but if they don't, uh, it, it'll be a big thing because as soon as they granted cert, I called a number of professors, not Professor Zelensky, unfortunately, but. Um, Hellerstein and Pomp and the rest of them and ask, you know, what do you think of this? And, and everybody's like floored because this seemingly, seemingly came out of nowhere. And uh, uh, hopefully the court agrees with us. And with that. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Um, you may not see this coming, but we're now going to go to Alan, um, uh, who will be using slides. That's why he's sitting over there. All right, go ahead. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Stan. Uh, well, I agree with Joe, and uh, I think Professor Zelensky does as well. This is an important case, and uh, we are indeed all very interested to see how the court decides it. Uh, I think those of you who did show up here today will have the privilege of hearing three really very different perspectives on the case, because although I agree with Joe that I want the court to rule in favor of the wins, I'll do so on uh, different uh, grounds uh, than they're arguing and than he's arguing. Uh, and of course, uh, Professor Zelensky will argue for the opposite outcome. So I, I view this case as having an odd posture uh, in the way that it has uh, been framed before the court. Now, maybe the reality is just that I have an odd perspective on the case, and therefore the posture looks odd to me. Well, you can judge. Uh, but um, in my opinion, the parties have overlooked the real problem with Maryland's tax system, which also, as it turns out, is a problem with the other states' tax systems as well, although to a lesser extent. I do, uh, as I'll explain, view the wins position as being analytically flawed, but I emphatically agree with Joe that the comptroller's position would be devastating to interstate commerce should the court adopt it. And therefore, given the uh, posture that the case is in, I do think that the court should embrace the wind's uh, position. So the comptroller's position essentially it starts with the premise that Maryland can tax residents out of state income at the same rate uh, as it taxes residents in state income and two other things besides, that in addition, the Maryland can also tax non-residents in state income um, at roughly similar rates, um, and that it furthermore need not provide a credit for residents out of state taxes. Now, as Joe explained, Maryland does provide a partial credit at present. Uh, it, credit can be claimed for the taxes you pay out of state up to the amount of the so-called state income tax that you pay to Maryland, but not, as he explained, the amount of so-called county income tax that the state also mandated to be collected. So they are providing a partial credit at present, but the comptroller's position is that actually no credit is required at all, and so the existing partial credit really is a matter of legislative grace. And that position, as Joe said, would really allow crippling discrimination against interstate commerce. Now, the WINS position is that Maryland can tax residents out of state income at the same rate as their in-state income, but only if it, Maryland provides a full credit for residents out of state taxes. Full credit meaning not necessarily a credit offsetting everything you paid out of state, but everything up to the amount of Maryland tax that was imposed, Maryland state tax and Maryland county tax. Um, so of course you may still have a residual tax to pay out of state if uh, the out of state has a higher tax rate than the state and county rate is in Maryland. Um, and the winds appear to concede that the state can also tax non-residents uh, in state income. So this position, in sharp contrast to the comptroller's position, would sharply, significantly limit discrimination against interstate commerce. But uh, the rationale that's being used, I, I think, is really uh, deeply flawed. So the um, key position that the, the key claim that the winds are making in this position is that Maryland's tax system, with its tax on residents and non-residents, would be valid if other states did not impose any taxes. But that because other states have chosen to impose their own income taxes, then Maryland has to accommodate their taxes by providing a credit when its residents earn out-of-state income. Well, I think that raises a number of uh, somewhat uh, troubling issues. If the Maryland tax system really is valid on its own terms, if that were true, why would it be required to accommodate other states? The comptroller's brief, I believe it was, has the rather nice line that there is no horizontal supremacy clause in the Constitution. There's a vertical supremacy clause saying that states have to, uh, state law has to give way to federal law, but no horizontal clause saying that one state's law has to give way to another's if each of them is valid on its own terms. And if you did think that some accommodation was needed here, you know, why would it be Maryland that is required to accommodate? Why does it have to provide the credit for the other state's tax instead of the other state providing a credit for Maryland's tax when Maryland residents earn income there. And it's also not really clear what kind of accommodation is needed. You can say a full credit uh, for you know, taxes paid up to the amount that Maryland is imposing, uh, but that actually raises a thorny set of issues. Uh, presumably, you would only need to give credit if the other state's tax is an income tax. You only have to allow credits against income tax for other income taxes, but what exactly is or is not an income tax? And also, although I don't want to really press this point, uh, credits are really uh, 
for one jurisdiction to provide a credit for another jurisdiction's tax really is very peculiar from a logical standpoint. Of course, it's an absolutely ubiquitous universal practice, and so people forget how peculiar it actually is simply because they've gotten used to it. Um, so I'm going to present a different position here today, which is one of what treatment is required for there to be no discrimination against interstate commerce. And this is the position laid out in the amicus brief that I and uh, several other economists and, and one law professor uh, filed. Um, some of my colleagues here at AEI joined the brief. Uh, let me give a plug here for David Daniels and Margaret Myers, Ed Richards, Kibbe and Orbe, who provided superb pro bono uh, work to us in um, filing this uh, brief. Uh, so the position uh, that we take is that Maryland can tax residents out of state income at the same rate as their in-state income only if it doesn't tax non-residents in-state income. So today, Maryland actually, like other states, taxes residents on their income in-state and out-of-state, and then also taxes non-residents if they earn income within the state. And we argue that combination is uh, discriminatory. Naturally, Maryland does not tax income that non-residents earn outside of the state there would clearly be no jurisdiction there. And this is just one example of a broader non-discrimination condition, which is that the combined tax on residents out of state income and on non-residents in state income should not exceed the tax on residents in state income. So you basically have interstate income flowing in both directions, into the state and out of it, and the combined tax on those two interstate income flows shouldn't exceed the tax on the intrastate income that the residents are doing in the state. And in fact, you can generalize this to other kinds of commerce, such as imports and exports. Uh, the key is to always combine the tax on inbound and outbound interstate transactions and compare it to the transactions that are purely intrastate. Uh, this also condition also applies to subsidies. There's no distinction between taxes and subsidies from an economic or logical perspective. Subsidies are just negative taxes, and so you can apply this condition plugging in the negative tax rates that's involved in a subsidy. So the statement would be that the subsidy combined subsidy to the two income flows in the two directions uh, should be at least as large, should not fall short of the subsidy that's provided to the purely intrastate transactions. And so why, where does this condition come from? Is it plucked out of thin air? Well, no, it's not. Uh, if this condition is met, and only if it's met, there is some possible income change that could occur in economic equilibrium such that we would preserve the incentives for interstate commerce. We would preserve the incentive for non-residents to earn income within the state and also the incentive for residents to earn income out of state. If the condition is not met, then no matter what happens to income levels, uh, there's going to be an impairment of incentives in at least one of those two directions, maybe both. So what this does tell you is that whether a state is allowed to tax residents out of state income depends on whether they tax non-residents in state income. And at first glance, that actually se apparently seems odd to many people that these apparently two unrelated taxes should really be intertwined in that way. But in fact, the economic equilibrium shows that these things are not at all unrelated. They're very closely intertwined with each other. If a state chooses to exercise its prerogative to tax non-residents in state income, then in order for non-residents to have, uh, still have the same incentive to earn income within the state, the before tax incomes need to go up in that state. But if it does, that would then discourage residents from earning out-of-state income if they could earn more in-state as well. And so if we want to maintain their incentive to earn out-of-state income, we cannot tax the out-of-state income. If we tax both in-state and out-of-state income for residents, then uh, they would have an incentive uh, to, uh, to, 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 do, to earn their income at home, and interstate commerce would be impaired. So these two separate inbound, outbound taxes are very much intertwined with each other. Now, the Supreme Court has used a test that it likes to call internal consistency, and that actually is the same as this non-discrimination condition, provided that the state does not make its tax rate depend on the tax rates that other states uh, choose. What internal consistency says is if a tax is okay if provided that every state copied the tax, then the nationwide tax on interstate transactions would not exceed the tax on intrastate transactions. Well, that is just the same as what I've said, right? If you had every state copying the tax, every interstate transaction would get hit with the inbound tax in one state and the outbound tax in another, 
you would need to add those up to get the nationwide tax. Meanwhile, an intrastate transaction, of course, would just be taxed by the state where it happened. And so if you wanted the nationwide burden on the interstate transactions to not go above the intrastate tax, you need that combined inbound and outbound tax to not exceed the tax on the intrastate. So the, sometimes people, the court has really, I think, been very confusing when it describes the motivation for this test. Some people assume that the problem would be having two states actually tax the same income. And this is viewed as a test for whether that's going to happen. But it's a bad test because it's based on a hypothetical situation where every state copies the tax instead of looking at what the states are actually doing. And so that's the rationale some people have for it. But it's really a test for whether the state's tax system in and of itself is discriminatory. So some people think the logic is, if every state copied this tax and there was no excess tax on interstate transactions nationwide, then let's treat the tax as being non-discriminatory. But no, it's the other way around. If the tax meets this condition, it is non-discriminatory, and therefore it can be copied by any number of states without putting an excess nationwide burden on interstate transactions. So that's how the, the cause and effect really goes. So as, this, as these remarks suggest, the so-called double taxation where two states tax a tran the same transaction is not a, the, the issue. Um, if two states have divergent tax systems, a transaction could easily be taxed by the two states that it happens to affect. But it provided each state system is non-discriminatory, their incentives for interstate commerce can still be preserved. There's still an income change that would preserve those incentives. And so there's no reason why either state needs to accommodate the other's tax. And actually illustrate that later if I have time. I just want to set aside a couple red herrings uh, quickly. Um, the neutrality that we're looking for is between interstate and intrastate transactions, which is how the Supreme Court has usually described it. But sometimes people interchange that with needing to treat in-state and out-of-state parties equally. You can't discriminate against out-of-staters. Well, that just that makes no sense at all. Um, all neutral subsidies and public services discriminate against out-of-staters. The state serves its residents, not the rest of humanity. All neutral taxes actually discriminate against in-staters. The state does not have authority to tax transactions between two out-of-staters. The notion that you would have to treat in-staters and out-of-staters equally is, is preposterous because they're not remotely similarly situated. It's hard to know what sense it could make to say that the government of Rhode Island has to provide the same treatment to Rhode Island residents and to Texas residents. That completely contradicts the fact that it has sovereignty over the people living in the one state and not those in the other. It also doesn't matter whether you say you're taxing the in-stater or the out-of-stater. Every interstate transaction has one party of each type, and you can always relabel the tax on one party as a tax on the other. The key thing is the overall tax on the transaction. And we also don't care whether we say we're taxing the transaction or the income from it. So um, I, maybe I should move quickly here. I guess what kinds of taxes are neutral that states could impose? Well, there's actually a wide range of options that states have, depending on their philosophies. And they have the sovereign right to choose among uh, all these neutral systems. One option would be a source tax, say 5% source tax, where you tax residents and non-residents in state income at 5%, but you don't tax residents out of state income. Um, and so that is a neutral system because incomes can change in a way that preserves incentives. Uh, if incomes go up to 105.26 in the state from a hypothetical $100 starting point, uh, then incentives in both uh, directions for interstate commerce are going to be preserved. Non-residents can clear $100 after tax in either state, and so can the residents as well, because in either case, they could work in the state, make $105.26, and pay 5% of that, which is $5.26. Uh, or they can work out of state and earn $100 and uh, not pay any tax at all. But there's a completely different tax, which is actually also neutral. You could have a 5% residence tax, where you tax residents on both their in-state and out-of-state income at 5%, with no tax on residents, uh, um, uh, non-residents' in-state income. And here, it's actually simpler. If in-state income stay at 100, incentives in both directions are preserved. Uh, non-residents uh, will clear $100 uh, in either state, because they're uh, not uh, subject to the tax and they earn 100 either way. And residents clear $95 no, in either state, because either way, they earn 100, and they pay the $5 tax in both cases. But you know, some state might actually feel like mixing these two types of taxes. Of course, that's fine, too. So you could imagine a state that does the 5% residence tax. Uh, they put 5% on residents' in-state income and 5% on residents' out-of-state income. And then on top of that, they do a second tax, which is a 5% tax, 
on a source basis, in-state income of residents and in-state income of non-residents. So that's all perfectly good. Of course, as you can see from the description of the two taxes, the residents' in-state income is subject to both of the 5% taxes. Uh, has to be for each of them to be neutral. So they're paying a total of 9.75. That's 5% and then 5% of the remaining 95%. Um, and uh, that uh, actually is neutral as well. You just need before tax income to go up to 10526 in the state. Non-residents will clear $100 uh, either way, uh, or in $100 tax free out of state, or 10526 in state, you pay 5%. Um, and uh, residents clear $95 either way. They can earn $100 out of state and pay 5, or in the 10526 in state, and then they'll pay 9.75% of that, uh, which is uh, 1026. So the key, of course, is that uh, you, it's not going to be neutral if you tax the residents' in-state income at 5% and then tax each of those interstate flows at 5%. Uh, th then there's no income change that can preserve these incentives in both directions. You can't use a single 5% tax on residents' in-state income and say, oh, that achieves parity with the residents' out-of-state income, and it also achieves parity with non-residents' in-state income. You can't double count that single tax to get neutrality in both uh, directions. So I don't know how much time I have here. So, uh, I'm going to give you seven more minutes. OK, well, that should be, uh, should be plenty. Um, so uh, I, uh, this question about double or multiple taxation is really uh, a bugaboo that uh, arises in these uh, discussions, I think. Uh, imagine that state A imposes a 5% residence tax, which is neutral, and state B imposes a 5% source tax, which is neutral. Now, these two sovereign states, of course, have chosen divergent paths, but that is their prerogative. This is often thought to have dreaded implications because, of course, the state A residents who earn income in state B uh, suffer the fate of double taxation. Uh, this single transaction is taxed by both states. They'll pay 5% source tax to state B, and then when the money comes home, they'll pay 5% of the remaining 95%, and so they'll bear a 9.75% tax burden, which does seem like a uh, dreadful fate indeed. Uh, but of course, there's no impairment of interstate commerce here. The two, each system is neutral, so naturally their combination is neutral as well. We just need incomes to rise to 105.26 in state B and to stay at $100 in state A, and then all incentives in all directions are preserved. Uh, state A residents uh, will clear $95 in either state um, if they work at home. Uh, they'll earn 100 and, and pay $5 tax. If they go to state B, they'll earn 105.26 and then pay a total 1026 in tax, while state B residents will clear $100 in either uh, state. They can either earn $100 tax free at home or 105.26 in, um, or 10526 at home and pay 5%, or they can earn $100 tax free over in state A, which has no source based tax. And so, uh, you know, there is no impairment of uh, incentives here. And that's so, not completely hypothetical, too, because that would be somebody living in Oregon and oh, absolutely. Me, working, yeah, no. working in Oregon and living in Washington. Yeah, double taxation is, you know, one would expect to be a relatively common situation if different sovereign states are choosing different tax policies. And so it's important to realize yeah, that's why it. Not that a lot of people work in Oregon and then live in Washington. Why that's not. <laughs> but it's, so it's important to realize why there's no discrimination that results against interstate commerce if, in fact, each state's tax system is neutral in its own perspective. You know, it just seems like impossible at first glance that could still be viable for state A resident to go earn income in state B when they're getting hit with two separate taxes. But each tax is neutral along its respective dimension, and therefore there's no uh, problem in the end. Because the uh, other people working in state B are also subject to its tax, the wage goes up and that compensates for that tax burden. Then they do pay the residence based tax from working in state B, but they would have paid that tax even if they had worked at home. So neither tax actually poses a competitive obstacle, and therefore there's no reason why either state needs to accommodate the other state's uh, tax. And again, no logical explanation of which one should do so if you somehow thought that one of them ought to. So having looked at these different positions, how ought the win case to be decided? Well, in an ideal world, you would apply non-discrimination principle to the win case, the Supreme Court's four-pronged test that it laid out in 1977 uh, for the, uh, the Constitution says that there's not supposed to be a tax discriminating against interstate commerce. So we could apply that. Well, we would strike down Maryland's tax system because they are, in fact, taxing both the residents' in-state income, the residents' out-of-state income, and the non-residents' in-state income 
at comparable rates. Now, as uh, fate would have it, every other state with an income tax, every single one, does that same thing. So we would strike down Maryland's tax system and all the others with it um, because of that uh, flaw. Now, it's true that the other states, other than Maryland, do provide the so-called full credit for the residents' out-of-state taxes. But a full credit doesn't zero out the tax on the residents' out-of-state income. Not always. It says, we'll give you credit for the taxes you paid out of state up to the amount that we're imposing on you. And so if the income is being earned in a state with a higher tax rate, there will still be a residual tax on the residents' out-of-state income. And if the state is already taxing all the income earned within its borders by both residents and non-residents, that is still a discriminatory outcome. So even the full credit doesn't uh, solve the problem. So realistically, what I would hope the court would do is to adopt the middle ground, which is basically the result that the winds are advocating, but on, on different grounds. The court could say that as long as a state does provide a full credit, which every state except Maryland is basically doing, then we will accept the standard set up, despite the fact that it is discriminatory. It is a universal practice and also a long-standing one. It actually does satisfy the internal consistency test, even though it doesn't satisfy the non-discrimination condition. And the reason is because here, the state does make its tax rate depend on what the other state is doing. And if the other states were copying Maryland's tax system and had the same rate as it did, the credit would zero out the other state's tax. So it actually satisfies internal consistency. But this is one of those situations where that doesn't mean that it satisfies non-discrimination. And of course, you know, uh, parties have not, you know, the, the winds have not requested that the court strike down discriminatory systems that offer full credits. But in my view, the court definitely does need to strike down discriminatory systems that don't offer full credits. Uh, and uh, that would, of course, would involve striking down uh, Maryland system. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Alan. Um, and now we, we turn to our third speaker who will, um, defend what Ellen just referred to as a ruling that would have a devastating impact on interstate commerce, I believe. Um, it is uh, Professor Edward Zielinski of Yeshiva University's um, Benjamin and Cardozo School of Law. Um, well, there you go. Okay, thank you. Um, I join in thanking the folks here at American Enterprise Institute for inviting us to speak here today. Uh, I don't have a lovely PowerPoint uh, like uh, my colleagues here. Uh, my children have made me swear off PowerPoint for the semester, and uh, I'm having withdrawal symptoms, so they sent one of my sons to make sure I don't fall off the wagon here today. Uh, I uh, do not accept the various teeth gnashing interpretations of the Wynn decision. I think Wynn can and should be decided very narrowly. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, ultimately the United States Supreme Court should uphold uh, the Maryland decision against constitutional challenge. And the first distinction that I want to make is one which I think in practice all of us accept, but and which in practice is not often as clear as it should be, but which I think is controlling here, and that's the distinction between tax policy and constitutional law. As a matter of tax policy, I agree with my colleagues here tonight, or today, uh, and I agree with the winds that a credit should be offered by the state of residence uh, to avoid uh, double taxation. Uh, but I don't think that we can find that principle of tax policy embedded in what we have come after 150 years to call the Dormant Commerce Clause. Uh, in what is perhaps the most famous dissent in the history of American jurisprudence, Oliver Wendell Holmes in Lochner said that the 14th Amendment does not enact Mr. Herbert Spencer's social statics. Well, the F Commerce Clause does not enact the tax policy considerations of those of us who consider ourselves tax policy mavens. In order to take tax policy and turn it into constitutional law, something else must happen. The fact of the matter is that tax policy is not well made in the courts. The courts can address these issues at best episodically. Taxes are inherently technical. 
ironically, they're technical and inherently political. And tax systems often involve, inherently involve the kinds of arbitrary decisions that courts should not legitimately be making. So that in order to rule uh, for the wins, you've got to come up with, in a legitimate way, a principled basis for the court to make its decisions. I don't think that there is such a principled basis. But the mere fact that as a matter of tax policy that the wins are correct, uh, I think begins the discussion. Uh, I don't think uh, that it ends it. Uh, and uh, in that context, uh, I want to advance a second uh, proposition, again, which all of us accept uh, in theory, but which I think has been conflated in discussion of win. Uh, and that is the discussion between the dormant commerce clause and, for lack of a better term, the explicit commerce clause. The commerce clause is fundamentally Congress's body or Congress's constitutional authority to enact. Now, historically, the dormant commerce clause has, I think, served a good and productive purpose over time. It's been very useful. But we're clearly seeing the secular eclipse of the dormant commerce clause. The courts simply cannot provide on a sustained basis the kind of rigorous, technical, political, continuing analysis that is necessary in order to regulate a national economy and its federal tax systems. And just because in an earlier and simpler age these ideas worked, I don't think it's necessarily the case that they work today. And I think it's important in this context to place aside a lot of what I frankly view uh, as some of the more overblown possibilities. So we're told that one thing that's going on here is there's a conspiracy between Justices Scalia and Thomas to get the dormant commerce, the dormant commerce clause wiped off the books. I don't think the court is likely to do that. I don't think the court has to do that. I think the court can decide when very narrowly. By the same token, I don't think if you believe that the Dormant Commerce Clause is part of our jurisprudence that you have to accept everything that's been written in the last 150 years. And that brings me to what I think is the fundamental point here, which uh, Alan uh, touched upon, and that is that the Dormant Commerce Clause concept of non-discrimination, despite its visceral appeal and despite its historic provenance, is today fundamentally incoherent. Uh, and uh, all one has to do is look at the economically equivalent policies and see how they would be treated if you took this rule of non-discrimination seriously. What the Maryland Court of Appeals said was that the wins, when they look at the decision to invest at home in Howard County or in Maryland, as opposed to investing out of state, that Maryland's law encourages them to invest at home and pay a single tax rather than to invest out of state and incur two taxes without the second tax being abated by a credit. That position is correct, and in fact it is solidly based in the court's case law. The problem is, is that case law doesn't make a great deal of sense anymore in a modern economy. Because in fact, everything, as Alan suggests, that Howard County does, everything that the state of Maryland does is for the benefit of its residents. Everything they do put a thumb on the scale to make people invest locally. Suppose that Howard County reduces its general rate, which they're allowed to do under Maryland law. That has the exact same economic impact. It encourages the winds to invest at home because the local tax is now lower rather than making an investment in an out-of-state uh, economy. Are we prepared to say that the courts are going to be policing and stopping general rate reductions by states and localities? I think not. And in fact, most of my colleagues who uh, are in favor of this, when you give them that example, they kind of treat it like Ross Perot's crazy aunt in the basement. Let's put that down there and forget about it. Uh, 
But the reality is you can't. Once you say that the courts, which is not a good place to be making tax policy, are supposed to be policing state and local policies that encourage local investments, the fact of the matter is then the courts have to police all of the provisions of our tax system and more. Suppose, for example, that Maryland increases the rapidity of depreciation schedules in order to incur local investments. This has precisely the same impact on the WINS decision to invest locally. That's why states encourage and, and reform their tax systems. Are we gonna say that that discriminates and therefore it can't be done? I think that there is no limiting principle and therefore I think ultimately the concept of non-discrimination is not going to be viable. And in fact, we're seeing the long-term secular decline of the Dormant Commerce Clause. Today we have pending in Congress all kinds of legislation. Uh, the Marketplace Fairness Act, uh, my favorite, the Multi-State uh, Tax uh, Fairness Act, which would prevent double taxation of telecommuters by New York, case in which I had some uh, a personal interest. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the courts simply cannot and should not be in the business of policing taxes. That's ultimately a political job that has to occur in political forums using statutes with technically supportive staff. Uh, and uh, it's not simply that the concept of non-discrimination is incoherent as to taxes, it's incoherent in general. One of the commonplaces of our discussion, both in law and in tax policy today, is that virtually any tax policy can be translated into a direct expenditure and vice versa. If Howard County builds an industrial park, that encourages the winds to invest at home. If Howard County improves its roads or Howard County improves uh, technical job training, that encourages the winds to invest at home. There is no principled basis for looking at a handful of policies like tax credits and saying you can't encourage investment at home unless you're prepared to say that the courts are going to police virtually everything that the states and localities do. That, I think, is a, pre is a conclusion from which most of us recoil and suggest that the basic premise is wrong, i.e., the non-discrimination principle uh, as it exists today. And, and therefore, I would respectfully suggest that at a very fundamental level, what Wynn is demonstrating is that for the long run, dormant commerce clause non-discrimination uh, is not a viable policy. That, by the way, is not to align with those who say that the Dormant Commerce Clause doesn't have any future. I think the Dormant Commerce Clause concepts of nexus and apportionment are very sensible for reasons which we go to now. And that is, uh, unlike uh, my colleague Joe, uh, I think the Solicitor General makes a very good point. The wins are voters in Maryland. The wins are being taxed and they're complaining about taxes being imposed upon them by the governor, the legislator, the county officials for whom they vote. And the Solicitor General, I think, correctly emphasizes that point because taxation and tax policy is inherently a political matter. The winds can vote in Maryland. There are constitutional provisions where we say the winds need to be protected from their own state. If the winds were claiming that they were being taxed on the basis of their religion or their race, but not the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause, particularly the Dormant Commerce Clause, should not be used in the case of uh, their vote, uh, the winds as voters. And this is now the concern that I have about the wind decision. And the wind decision, I think, if the court, as I suspect they will, says that the winds are not protected by the Dormant Commerce Clause, because they vote in Maryland. I am a little worried about Wynn, but for different reasons than uh, Alan and Joe. Uh, and that is because the states are, with great aggressiveness, attacking no or taxing non-voters as residents. It isn't the case that all residents get to vote. Under their statutory residence laws, states are aggressively attacking people 
who are not voters and imposing a second resident-based income tax on them. Uh, we just had another case in the New York courts, the Noto family. Uh, the Noto family uh, is a situation where they lived in and vote and are domiciled in Connecticut. They pay tax on all of their income to Connecticut. They also have a summer home uh, at the beach uh, in the Hamptons. New York also then imposes a second total tax on them as residents, not giving any credit for the New York K, uh, the, the Connecticut taxes. That's a very different situation than the winds. The winds are complaining about taxes being levied upon them by the state in which they vote. I think that there's a role for the Commerce course to play. By the way, the next time you give Governor a Cuomo uh, an award, please tell him that maybe there's some other problems in New York that still need to be fixed. But the bottom line is, the bottom line is, I think that the court can draw a very narrow and limited opinion here and should draw a very narrow and limited opinion. They don't have to say no dormant commerce clause. They don't even have to say no non-discrimination. All the court has to say is the concept of discrimination in a modern economy is sufficiently problematic that we're not going to extend it further into situations like this. They don't have to repeal their existing case law. In fact, I think this would be a very bad case for the court to engage in fundamental reanalysis, either of the Commerce Clause as a whole or reconsider the entire concept of non-discrimination. They haven't signaled that possibility. Those possibilities really haven't been briefed and developed by the lower courts. So I think the court can engage in a very modest and should engage in a very modest rule that they won't extend dormant commerce clause to this area because the winds vote. I hope that they will make it clear that the winds as domiciled voting residents have rights. That leaves the door open in the future for the court to act as it should against the problem of non-voters being taxed as residents. And that leads me to suggest that win, while it's an important decision, is not going to be ultimately the crisis that some predict. Uh, thank you very much. I, before we, before I open it up to the, uh, to the room, I wanted to give Alan and Joe the chance to respond if you uh, desire so. Uh, Jim. Uh, <clears throat> Professor Zielinski brought in some history, and so I figure I should too. Um, States could not tax anything in interstate commerce for a century and a half after the Constitution was ratified, which was, uh, as far as bright line rules go, uh, pretty pretty stark. And and that came about just from the the founders' experience under the Articles of Confederation, where states really taxed interstate commerce. They uh, imposed embargoes against each other. They uh, imposed tariffs and and, and blockades, and it, w it was a big problem and doing a lot of damage to the national economy, and indeed was one of the reasons that we had a constitutional convention to come up with a better system, including uh, the Commerce Clause in it, to, to prevent that from happening again. And uh, the court developed its dormant Commerce Clause doctrine pretty early on. I think it was the 1810s was the first couple of cases uh, where they laid down this rule of states cannot tax interstate commerce. And, and that was the rule for most of the next century and a half. It began to break down as we became even more of an integrated economy and out of recognition that states should be able to tax resident individuals and businesses even if they're engaged in interstate commerce for their just share of, of the activity. So just because the winds are engaging in interstate commerce, it doesn't mean Maryland it should be prohibited from taxing any dollar of their income, which was the rule. They should be taxed just like everybody else. And that's what ultimately led to the complete auto decision that Alan referenced in the 1970s, which included the non-discrimination provision. States hate this. States want to be able to tax, and uh, not just resident income, you know, the, Alan went through his slides of all the permutations. States want to tax all of it at, at, as much as they can, especially if they get to tax non-residents or activity happening outside of states, especially business activity happening out of, uh, happening outside of states, because uh, it, it's more, more revenue. and. Uh, I, I, I do agree with, uh, you know, I'm glad Professor Zelensky sees a problem with taxing non-voters 
uh, so if the winds were from some out-of-state uh, couple and Maryland was trying to tax it, he recognizes that there is no political representation uh, release valve at issue in that case, and that would raise a constitutional problem. Um, I wouldn't draw the line where he draws it, just because uh, state hunger for, for, tax, for taxes and, and their willingness to exercise their power uh, to, at the, to the detriment of the national economy is a big problem. And we see that with some of the pending congressional litigation that he, uh, uh, congressional legislation that he referenced. So, uh, you know, the, the mobile workforce bill, which is a, a bill that would limit state authority to tax non-residents who are only in the state for a brief amount of time. So just for an example, Professor Zelinsky um, lives in, in Connecticut or New York now? Connecticut. Connecticut. And he's here in D.C., earning, uh, presumably earning income for today. Um, oh, get, here's a volunteer. Did you take a vacation day from your, you, no? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, technically, not only does he have to fill out a D.C. tax return and, and pay it. D.C. might be different, actually, because D.C. is weird. But uh, in most cases, uh, you have to set up withholding in advance with your employer. And that's a big problem. And so the, the proposal, federal proposal would set a 30-day grace period on all of that. Um, it's not getting a lot of action in Congress because Congress, for the most part, sees this as the court's problem to solve. And the courts don't want to step on and do anything because they view it as Congress's problem. So we do, I do recognize that we, we do have a little bit of finger pointing going on right, near, right here, which Professor Zelensky alluded to, that you know, maybe we should just let Congress do its job. Uh, well, Professor Zelensky, Congress isn't doing a lot of, a lot of its job nowadays, so I'm, I'd, I'd uh, be reluctant to um, throw everything overboard on, on the credit for taxes paid to another state, which will lead to real and lasting harm just out of the view that, you know, maybe uh, 100, you know, 200 years of, of jurisprudence is misguided. Um, I'm always eager to take the stand that the Supreme Court has been wrong for a long time on things. and. Um, a couple of years ago, we did the Kentucky versus Davis case, and Alan and I were literally the only two briefs in that case, and, and we lost that one seven to two, uh, unfortunately. I still think I was right. And the, the reason how the court uh, ruled in that way is they created an exception to the Commerce Clause. So uh, I, I feel like that does more damage. This, the, this narrow, we're going to create exceptions to the Commerce Clause rule, but still pretend like we're upholding complete auto, which I think is the more realistic outcome of what you're proposing. And uh, that ultimately leads to just more incoherence in the doctrine and, uh, most troublingly, more freedom for states to continue doing what they're doing, which is uh, uh, taking every chance they get to discriminate against interstate commerce. Uh, just one last point of your, your broader point, which I'm going to kind of put under the umbrella as the Kuno point, because it came up a lot during the discussions over the Kuno, Ohio case a couple of years ago. The idea that everything states do benefits residents, so therefore we can't we, we have to throw up our hands and give up on the non-discrimination inquiry because um, everything's not everything's discriminatory. Uh, and this pushes a little bit back against something Alan said too, which is costs and subsidies to me as a lawyer uh, are not two sides of the same coin. That uh, sending somebody to jail for a week and taking away and telling somebody they can't go on vacation for a week is not the same thing. Um, subsidizing somebody if they engage in activity and, uh, and imposing an excess tax on somebody, uh, they have very real uh, effects, and I think we look at them differently legally. And uh, the analysis that I always look at is uh, the, the extent that a state punishes people for engaging in out-of-state behavior uh, is, is definitely of more significance than the fact that a state is using its in-state budget resources to subsidize people for engaging in a certain activity. And, uh, you know, that's not always the, the happiest outcome for economists, and I, I work with a room full of economists, but um, it leads to the right result in uh, every Supreme Court Dormant Commerce Clause case that they've looked at, um, the, the importance of, uh, of non-discrimination looking at that. And, and I think that's a, a more realistic limiting principle than uh, giving up on it and letting state legislators decide whether or not they should discriminate against interstate commerce uh, through punitive tax, uh, punitive taxes on people who engage in it, because that is, um, a, a, to me, that's a dead end uh, in hoping that uh, they'll self-restrain in that, in, in that avenue.
Uh, Alan? So actually, I agree with a lot of the things that Ed said, but I really draw completely different conclusions. The particular version of the non-discrimination principle that he's talking about is indeed utterly incoherent. Um, and I also do think that any principle does have to apply uniformly to taxes and subsidies. So I'll disagree with Joe on that. I think that any tax can be rewritten as a negative subsidy. And so we need a principle that will work across the board. And the principle that uh, Professor Zielinski was critiquing you know, does indeed uh, fail. It cannot be the case that the Supreme Court can say to a state, you can't encourage investment to come here. States absolutely have a right to encourage investment in their state. They have the right to provide extravagant subsidies for investment inside their state that they do not provide to investment anywhere else in the world. But of course, those subsidies must be provided both to residents investing in the state and to non-residents. And then, of course, that is perfectly neutral between interstate and intrastate transactions. At the same time that you're encouraging residents to invest at home, which would, of course, be a reduction in interstate commerce, you're encouraging non-residents to also invest within the state, which is an encouragement of interstate commerce. And as the examples show, that type of you know, place-based, source-based tax or subsidy you know, does have neutral effects between interstate and intrastate uh, transactions. By the same token, a state can provide extravagant subsidies to its residents that it doesn't provide to anybody else on the planet, uh, provided that those subsidies apply both to the residents in state and out of state activities. Again, it will encourage them to do more of both, but there's no favoritism for interstate over intrastate transactions. And so uh, the same principle, of course, applies to subsidies. It applies to the roads and industrial parks. Uh, if a state provides police protection uh, to people uh, within the state, who are producing both for the home state market and for the export market, uh, that's a perfectly neutral subsidy vis-a-vis -vis interstate commerce, even though it discriminates in favor of the state's residents uh, who uh, receive the uh, police protection. Uh, but of course, if a state were to deny police protection uh, to uh, firms that export it, then I think we would want to apply non-discrimination. We wouldn't say this is a service or a subsidy instead of a tax, and so let's give it a pass. Uh, so we really should apply this same principle, neutrality between interstate and intrastate transactions, and just apply that across the board to taxes, subsidies, and services. And that, I think, is a perfectly principled basis, a perfectly coherent uh, principle that can be applied, which most of the court's decisions actually are consistent with. And even the court's terminology is often pretty consistent with that. They usually talk about discrimination against interstate commerce, not discrimination against uh, out-of-staters. Um, I do want to also say the fact that the winds vote in Maryland, uh, that, that, that can't, if you say that a state can impose a discriminatory tax on interstate transactions simply because the tax is labeled as being on the in-state party, then of course discrimination is unlimited because every interstate transaction has one in-state party. And by simply labeling the tax as being imposed on that party instead of the other one, uh, then you, know, you have carte blanche. So I don't think that this, the Maryland tax is any more acceptable because the tax is imposed on the winds instead of Maryland imposing a payroll tax on the, or some type of uh, withholding tax on their out-of-state uh, income payer. Uh, by the same token, a tax on non-residents working within the state you know, doesn't uh, become any uh, more acceptable if you instead structure it as being a tax on the in-state person who's paying that income. Uh, that you know, distinction can simply be manipulated quite easily. The whole point of non-discrimination under the Dormant Commerce Clause is to say that a state cannot tax more heavily its residents for engaging in interstate transactions than it does for engaging in intrastate uh, transactions. And I think it's important for the national economy to maintain that. Uh, just a, a closing word, I mean, should there be a dormant commerce clause or, you know, to what extent should we leave this up to Congress? I think that you could, in principle, make a case that there shouldn't be a dormant commerce clause at all. Justices Scalia and Thomas do argue that and, and put it all into Congress's uh, bailiwick. Frankly, though, I think if you did that, Congress would soon enact a vaguely worded statute saying that states cannot do anything to discriminate against interstate commerce, and the courts applying that statute would face all of the difficulties that they're facing today in applying the uh, constitutional doctrine. Uh, the framers, I think, certainly did envision that the Constitution would prevent the balkanization of the national market. It's unclear if they expected Congress to pursue that role through legislation or whether they expected the courts to do it as part of a self-executing constitutional doctrine. But I think we do need that type of federal protection to keep the national economy uh, operating. And uh, so I, I do view uh, very harmful consequences here if we say that this you know, very discriminatory tax system uh, is upheld. If, if I can just, um, two simple thoughts. Um, 
<clears throat> you know, it's very easy to look at the contemporary Congress and say, well, how can you let them be uh, the four folks you're going to rely on? Uh, the fact of the matter is, of course, we have 200 years of disdaining Congress. I can quote Abe Lincoln, Ambrose Bierce, uh, Will Rogers. Uh, they said it very well. Uh, if we're going to compare the ideal notion of a court with the reality of Congress, well, then, of course, we know who wins that comparison. But the reality is, as someone who spent a little time studying and looking at courts, they're not very good either. When a politician puts on a robe, there's no reason to suddenly think that he or she is now uh, like a Pericles of Athens. Uh, and many of the same influences that influence laws, politics, campaigns, often are the folks who dominate courts, who can litigate these cases, who have the law firms to be in these courts, who becomes a judge. So I don't think we ought to be unrealistic. Uh, John Marshall isn't around anymore. Uh, Sam Rayburn is not around anymore. We have to deal with human beings as they are and the institutions as we have as they are. Given the fact that our institutions are imperfect, I think that the legislative process is a better imperfect process than the judicial process, an imperfect process. And uh, on the tax spending equivalents, uh, the fact of the matter is that we don't have in our law a clear distinction. The uh, Supreme Court, in fact, has not. You know, we have all kinds of cases out there, West Lynn Creamery. It is not clear that the court is going to draw a line, as I think they should. Uh, but it is not at all clear that the distinction between taxes and non-taxes is really built into our Commerce Clause uh, jurisprudence. The folks who brought the CUNO uh, decision are convinced that it's not, and there may be some truth to that. That's why I look at all of this and say maybe it's time uh, to rethink it. Was John Marshall right to decide Gibbons and Ogden as he did? Well, we could argue that maybe he wasn't, that maybe if he had said that the ferry going between New York and New Jersey can be taxed, maybe that would have made a very great difference in our constitutional history, and the path-dependent path that we've gone on has allowed Congress not to do its role under the Commerce Clause. We don't know that counterfactual. We can only speculate. What we can look at is where we are today, and I respectfully suggest that to extend uh, the concept of non-discrimination to the winds takes an idea that is not terribly coherent, pushes it farther than it has to go, and for that reason I think the court can reverse without engaging in any kind of revolution, doctrinal or otherwise, which it's really not, I think, prepared or properly briefed to do. Uh, thank you very much. I think we're ready for questions from the audience. Excuse me, do you, mind, do you mind waiting for the mic? Say who you are, Fred. Yeah, yeah hi, I'm Fred Nice with the Council on State Taxation, and I appreciate the dialogue um, all three of you have had here today um, and your different perspectives on this. I, I think what could be a very significant case. The one question I have is um, just looking at Complete Auto, and you know, Professor Zelensky, you had looked at an extension. I look at this as a case where the court has the ability just to do an affirmation that the Commerce Clause applies to all types of entities, whether you're a resident, non-resident, a C Corp or an S Corp. I think one of the things we have to remember here is the wins, the income that's being taxed is not their wages. It's actually their investment in an S Corp that doesn't have a right to vote. Um, so if Maryland turned around and you know it had um, imposed its tax directly on the S Corp, I assume you would argue that there was then Commerce Clause protection for the S Corp versus the um, tax being a flow through um, applying to the wins directly as individuals. Uh, to me, you're applying a very narrow test, and I guess I don't understand why you wouldn't just argue that complete auto, from what I was hearing from your dialogue, should only be the first prong, should only really be a substantial nexus prong. Um, why, why are you arguing for a narrow application? Well, well, first of all, I want to clarify, I'm in favor of both nexus and apportionment, because those are principles that I think get to the question of political representation. 
so that uh, I believe that there is a role to be played by the apportionment clause, and in particular in cases like the Notos, when a non-voter is taxed as a resident on his worldwide income, even though he or she spends half or less of the year in that state, it strikes me that's the classic case where a rule of apportionment makes sense. You've got two states, apportion the base between them. So uh, insofar as I left you with the impression that I think the apportionment rule is not a good idea, I wanna, I wanna correct that because that's not the impression that I've left or the impression that I've hopefully uh, established in my writings. So with that, help, help me, I don't know if that reframes the question for you or not. No, thank you, but I think if you focus in on apportionment, you, um, with Mr. Viard's presentation and going through the discrimination, you have that going on here where Maryland is taxing the same income, um, non-residents and residents, which is going to result in more than 100% of the income being taxed um, under the internal consistency prong. How then do you justify that? Uh, well, the, the, it's a, a simple, the, lots of justifications. The most obvious one is history. The principles that we use today did not come from John Marshall or the guys in Philadelphia. They were developed in the years following our Civil War, both domestically and internationally, as we confronted these issues. And so, uh, particularly in the early part of the 20th century, a lot of folks looked at this and said, uh, you have two bases for tax, and here I do agree with the uh, Solicitor General's uh, report. Uh, you have the political allegiance of the taxpayer. That is a, a jurisdictional basis for taxing his or her worldwide income. You then have the source base, which is legitimately taxed as to the activity within the states. We all agree that that potentially leads to double taxation. And I think the system of credits that has evolved as the national and international norm, I think was a very sensible resolution of those issues. I don't believe, by the way, that it was the courts that drove that resolution. I think it's the courts that, in effect, adopted and adhered to that resolution as it was developed by uh, domestic uh, and international thinkers and lawmakers in this area. So. Uh, again, I don't think there's going to be this great crisis if the court rules against the winds. Uh, I'm not, frankly, convinced that states are going to wholesale uh, reduce their credits. If they do, then we will have a very healthy political debate in our state capitals and in our country about what the tax rules ought to be. Tax policy is ultimately a political issue. The courts aren't a good place to make tax policy. Appreciate your comments. I just wanted to uh, offer a kind of side note on this question of residence and source, each being a legitimate basis of taxation, which I absolutely agree with. I think it's perfectly coherent for a state to say they're going to tax the people that owe allegiance to them, and perfectly coherent for a state to say that they're going to tax the income within their borders. Uh, of course, the state just needs to be consistent on that uh, front. So if a state really does think that uh, residence or political allegiance is the right uh, principle for taxation, uh, that's a perfectly great uh, choice, and the state should then tax its uh, residents on all of their income. But of course, it would be completely complete contradiction for it to turn around and then be taxing the income that non-residents earn within the state, because there it's saying that income is not, that the residence is not the basis after all, but instead we should have a source-based tax. And of course, a source-based tax is fine too if we think that's the right principle and we can tax all the income in the state no matter who earns it. But then, of course, that implies that the residents' out-of-state income shouldn't be taxed. And again, if you want to do a mix of the two, that's fine as well. But it needs to be a consistent mix that if I'm going to tax both residents and source, I should tax twice the situation where there is both residents and source within the state. Uh, I just want to agree with Professor Zielinski that apportionment should be more of a constitutional issue than it is. This is something that, uh, at the same time they were writing complete auto, unfortunately, the Supreme Court left to the states to sort out, uh, making sure there's uniform apportionment rules to the s between states, and that's become a mess. Um, states don't have uniform apportionment rules w w between each other, and that's a big detriment to interstate commerce, and uh, I, th I think it should be more of a constitutional issue than it is. And it also highlights, in my opinion, the problem of saying, well, states will figure this out, and they're not going to discriminate against interstate commerce, because in that case, they have 
Sure, go ahead. I think. Appreciate it again. I, I think a really good dialogue. Um, this is to Mr. Viard, and um, it deals with the political reality of uh, looking at the state's current sales and use tax system. Right now, you know, typically the states uh, they impose a sales tax. That's the over counter sales. And then they impose a use tax on you know the destination and where something's actually going to be used, and they're providing credits in that mix. And am I to understand with what you were you know, saying is that you don't think that should be a credit mechanism whatsoever, that you have to be very consistent on how you're imposing the tax to eliminate discriminatory taxation? Again, as an ideal matter, absolutely. And one can then step back and say, given where we do stand in history, should the court actually take non-discrimination to its logical limit? But yes, I agree uh, that as a matter of economic principle, uh, that a credit is an inadequate substitute, and instead there should be neutrality and consistency in how the tax base is defined to begin with. So in other words, uh, a state could uh, tax all of the items that are first purchased in the state, or they could tax all items that are ultimately used in the state, or some other self-consistent basis. I don't think, as an ideal matter, a state should be allowed to say, we will tax if either of those things happen in the state. But then we're going to try to fix it by allowing a credit, a credit that only goes up to the amount of the tax that we impose. So that's not an ideal solution. Again, might it be acceptable, given where we stand in history? Well, maybe so, especially because I think that's less of a problem than it is in this income tax context. But no, as a matter of principle, the state should be adopting, every state should be adopting a neutral, uh, internally consistent uh, tax base and not relying on credits uh, to uh, somehow salvage a inconsistent discriminatory definition of the base. So if, um, if it was structured so that uh, each jurisdiction, uh, taking the wins for example, um, Maryland was decided only to tax the portion of the Maryland income uh, a portion to, uh, excuse me, Maryland decided only to tax the wins income to the extent that it's a portion to Maryland and if you add up all the apportion amounts, it adds up to 100%. Um, would that be satisfactory constitutionally to you? And then I'm more curious, would it be satisfactory to Professor Zlonsky? It would be acceptable to me. Well, I, I'd want to think about it, but my first instinct is, is that I think a lot of things are constitutionally acceptable to me that are not acceptable to you guys. Uh, it, it's hard for me to say whether that makes sense or not but I don't understand why it should be judges making that decision rather than the legislators in Annapolis or the folks down the hill. Uh, and so if you say to me as a matter of tax policy, I'd want to think about that. I'd also want to think about your proposal as a matter of tax policy that if you're going to use source and residence base, you've got to impose both on, uh, on the winds. Those are interesting ideas of tax policy. I don't think those are the questions before the court in Wynn. The question before the court, I respectfully suggest, is not what is the right tax policy. The question is whether this concept of dormant commerce clause non-discrimination should be used by the court to intervene in what I fundamentally think is tax policy. My answer to that is no. Yeah, I mean, I really do agree in, in many respects with what Professor Zelensky is saying because I think that states should have a broad range of policy options from which to choose. The issue really is just whether there's discrimination against interstate commerce or not. And when you look at the neutrality condition, it really does give the states enormous flexibility. So yes, you know, to, to repeat my answer to Joe, states could adopt a wide variety of apportionment formulas uh, that are internally consistent. There would be a, a narrow exception if they're targeting things that where the, it, where the de facto burden on interstate transactions would be larger than those on intrastate. But there's no one right apportionment formula that every state should have to use, or even a narrow set of them. And similarly, yeah, residence tax, source tax, these are radically different. What do states want to do to encourage investment within their states, provided it encourages it by both residents and non-residents. States just have, you know, carte blanche on that. I think that uh, I definitely do resist any notion that states have to choose policies that are economically efficient or uh, policies that avoid all kinds of distortions. Instead, uh, you know, I think the, what the court said is 
tax, taxes and subsidies shouldn't discriminate against interstate commerce. If you've got the neutrality between intrastate and interstate transactions, you know, then the rest of it is up to the political process and let the states, each of them, sort out what the best tax policy is or is not. Uh, yes, Nikolai Pusak. Hello, uh, Nikolai from AI. I have a question to Professor Zelinsky. Can you go a bit more in depth about why courts would have trouble uh, citing issues of tax policies and then reaching decisions about them, and maybe provide some examples? Yeah, uh, the example is American history. Uh, courts are excellent for resolving cases that have been briefed by the parties to resolve particular cases on an episodic basis. That's where our courts function well. Sometimes our courts function brilliantly. When particular cases are brought to them properly briefed, that's not how we make tax policy. That's not how we should make tax policy. And tax policy is, first of all, highly technical. Courts don't have technical staffs engaging in such policy. Tax policy is continuous. Courts deal with episodic cases that are brought to them by the litigants. Tax policy is highly political. That's one of the paradoxes, one of the reasons I enjoy it so much. It's both political and technical. And even though judges get their jobs as pol in, in political ways, certainly federal judges are not politically accountable. So that's ultimately why tax policy is better made by elected officials who two, four, six years have to go to the public and say, here are the lines that I've drawn. Tax policy ultimately involves some very arbitrary lines. The tax rate's gonna be 15%, and then it's 16%, and then it's 17%. The tax base is going to cover items A, B, and C, but not items D, E, and F. Those in a democracy are the kinds of decisions that should be made in a legislative and or regulatory forum, courts aren't good places for the decision. And I suspect, and by the way, I'm not someone who believes that we should overly think the courts spend a lot of time uh, conspiring or thinking about these things, but I think that the court instinctively understands that. And let me give you one of the best examples we all know, which is Quill and National Bellis Hess. Court said in Quill, we're going to insist on physical presence in order for the states to collect sales tax. The court has, although it's had several opportunities, refused to intervene subsequent to that. I think the court is right. I think the court is saying this has got to be worked out. The question of sales tax nexus has got to be worked out by the states, by the Congress, in a political way. I think that's a wise decision. I hope they make a similarly wise decision and win. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question, if any. Otherwise, we are done here, and I would like to uh, thank our panelists. Um, this is fascinating. I'm very sad you have not all come to agreement <laughs> how these things go. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, well, that's it. I apologize for the promo joke. I just oh, couldn't. Yeah. couldn't